All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, welcome for coming, guys. Uh, I am going to be trying to be conscious of the fact that I have the after lunch slot. Um, so I'm going to err on the side of running short rather than long. Um, and that way, we'll have plenty of time to dig into questions, I hope, here at the end. Um, yeah, so the talk today is dog food development. Uh, open edX by develop or for developers by developers. Um, All right, so I'm Stephen Birch. I'm, uh, I work with the Open EdX team here at Stanford University. I'm the technical lead uh, of our small little working group. Um, those of you may have seen me on GitHub, uh, STV, STNFRD, that's Steve Stanford, no vowels. Uh, yeah, it's complicated. Uh, oh, well. Um, but yeah, just a quick background on me. Uh, so Bachelor of Science, Computer Science, uh, also double majored in French at a really small school in Ohio that you surely have never heard of. Um, I actually taught myself web development well before that. Um, I, I taught myself HTML when I was 13 or so, I think. Um, so I've been doing this for a little while now. Um, I've worked at startups. I've done nonprofit work. I've done non-technical nonprofit work. Um, and then now, of course, uh, here in the ed tech space, uh, been, with, been with the team at Stanford for a little over two years now. Uh, when I'm not writing code for edX, I surprisingly also write other code elsewhere. Uh, I contribute to a number of open source programs or projects. Uh, I also write poetry. I write code. Po I, write, I write code. I write poetry. I write code poetry. Uh, if you want to talk about the works on that, please grab me afterward. Uh, we can talk about it over a drink. Um, yeah, I, sp I speak a little bit of Francais, uh, that major coming into use, and I watch zombie movies. Um, so another topic of conversation. Please, beer, zombies, living dead. Let's do it. Um, but the topic at hand, dog fooding. Um, what in the heck is it? Um, before I tell you what it is, I want to just tell you it's awesome. Uh, it's something that if you aren't using it, uh, you do want to use it. Yeah, delicious. Um, but you know, seriously, what is dog fooding? So simply put, dog fooding, the idea of dog fooding is using your own product. Uh, the classic example of this is the car dealership, the car salesman who drives the company car. Uh, the idea is this shows to the customers, wow, this person must have faith in the thing that they do and the thing that they sell uh, if they're willing to, you know, to trust their lives, their families with it as well. Um, granted, our software, we don't always risk our lives, but there's still merits to it anyway. Um, now, the term itself, dog fooding, where does this come from? There are some people would prefer a more attractive name. I've heard uh, drinking your own champagne uh, you know, is, a, is, a, is a, a nicer way to go about it. Uh, but dog fooding, there, you know, there's an apocryphal story that this came out of TV commercials in the 1970s, the Alpo, uh, Alpo dog food uh, owner talking about feeding it to his own dog um, and what that's worth. Uh, as far as recorded history goes, so we start seeing uh, documents surfacing, you know, at least out of Microsoft in the late 80s, uh, explicitly using this term uh, and talking about using their own software, uh, specifically then within their, uh, with their NT and their server uh, frameworks. Um, yeah, I think Donald Knuth, uh, this is my one big blo block wall of text, excuse me. Uh, Donald Knuth really hits, hits it out of the park with this, talking about the text program. Uh, when he realized that it's not just a matter of designing a system, but also being the, implement the implementer, also being the first large scale user, the main primary user of that software, um, but not stopping there, actually then writing the user manual, telling people how to use it. Um, and he attributes this to the ability to have, have fixed hundreds of bugs that he otherwise, or issues that they otherwise wouldn't have even noticed, um, only by actually being a daily user of it in and out. Um, so yeah, so naturally there, if we're talking about it, um, I, I decided not to waste my time. There are actually a lot of really good reasons to, to be using your own software. Um, you know, I mentioned already the car salesman, the idea of brand loyalty uh, instills confidence. Um, you know, they, like I said, the, the, car, the car is the easy example. Uh, another one of my favorites is uh, there was a man who was a woodworker, uh, but he also had a physics background. And he designed a, a cutting saw that could actually detect the, 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 the change in impedance between, uh, between wood and between a human finger, other kinds of organic matter, and it could actually stop the saw blade within a fraction of a second before, you're, before you, uh, you had any kind of serious injury. Uh, and he proved it by running his hand through the saw. I promise no video of that today, though. Um, but yeah, this is, he, he had faith in the product that he had built uh, and wanted to demonstrate that to people. And he got the message across. Um, it helps you find friction, as, uh, friction faster as well. 
uh, there, you know, there's only so there's only so much that can come to light from that quick that five ten minute product overview, the walkthrough. You sit down with the product team. All right, did this check our boxes? Yeah, it seems to generally work. Uh, and we often find it's an entirely different story when we actually sit down and surprise use it like a real user's gonna use. When they're swapping back and forth on context, when they're trying to you know, pull something up in the midst of something else, um, oftentimes just actually trying to use it and accomplish something uh, really reveals uh, you know, where, where these use cases start to fall apart. And you know, just continuing on with that, testing is not the same as regular use. Uh, now, naturally, we you know we put a lot of diligence into into writing our test suites. We want them to be as comprehensive as possible, cover all of our use cases. But again, it's never the same. It's never going to be used the same as a real user uh, in front of a keyboard. This is why we have explicit frameworks uh, that actually simulate random mouse presses all over the screen. That simulate just entering in random gibberish text in different contexts. Because as silly as it sounds, that's how users do it. Users will do the stupidest thing if you just sit down and watch them long enough. Um, I love our users, don't worry. Um, but yeah, actually doing it in real life uh, is really going really to reveal this to you. Um, and because actually going through it and, and, and not testing, but actually trying to accomplish a larger goal that your software uh, you know, alleges that it can help with, really allows you to, to step into that, that, that role of more of, an, uh, more of empathy as opposed to sympathy. It's not just feeling bad for your users that complain that the progress page takes a really long time to load or that a specific component has too much friction around it. It's one thing for us to say, oh, OK, that's not that big of a deal. Um, this was one of my biggest takeaways from this project, and actually digging in with the edX with, with, you know, uh, ecosystem uh, to actually try to make a course myself was I realized the little things I would brush aside, where it's no big deal, I'm just going to make this quick change and be done with it, when all of a sudden that was no longer a minor annoyance in my way in testing, but this was actually a showstopper preventing me from my larger goal. My goal was no longer to, to use the system, but to get something out of it, and I wasn't able to do that when I hit this friction. Um, so that was a big eye-opener for me. Um, but so these, these are the plus sides. These are some of the good things that we get out of it. Uh, dog fooding is, it really is, it's, it's, what it's doing is revealing to you the truth, the reality behind your software, whether it works or sometimes that it's revealing that it's not working for you. You know, sometimes when, when you see something going on, it's, you know, the, it may not be an issue of in and of itself, but it can be indicative of a larger issue. Um, I, you know, early out of school, I was working at a, at a startup in Southern California, and I was playing around with our sign-in, sign-up pages, our, our logistration pages for the, you know, the edX equivalent. And I started, you know, I was noticing that the keyboard shortcuts and the tab navigation, things, things weren't working the way that, that I, as a power user, as, you know, as a keyboard ninja, really wanted it to work. And naive, fresh out of school, Steven, grabbed my boss, pulled him aside, oh, hey, we should change this. It'll be great. It'll make it better for crazy, nerdy keyboard shortcuts. Um, as you might expect, that was immediately laughed aside and never saw the light of day. Um, and as much as it pains me to, you know, to think back to you know, idealistic 23-year-old me, um, it made sense. That was the right business call. Me talking about crazy keyboard shortcuts wasn't the best place for our small company to be, you know, to be allocating resources. What we didn't realize at the time, what I, you know, the argument that I could have made had I known better, was that this was actually representative of larger accessibility issues that were, that were systemic across our platform. Um, but with how I message it, because I was just looking at its surface level, we didn't, get to the, we didn't reveal the deeper end of it. Um, but again, had we played around with it more um, and had this not been 10 more years ago and we actually cared about accessibility, maybe we'd have done something. Um, or maybe. There's, there's one worse alternative, though. Um, just maybe. Your product's just terrible. Um, and this, yeah, I mean, as much as it pains us to do, there, you know, we, we spend you know, weeks, months, years investing in these products. Um, and sometimes, it, you know, as humbling as it is, it's important to sit down, walk through it, and realize, wow, we just wasted a big chunk of our time. We either need to stop doing this or we need to go back to the drawing board and really you know, reevaluate how we're going about this. Um, I was you know, at a, at another, at a, in another role at a startup, and we had a number of product offerings. One of the things that we had, though, was a, uh, we had a social network component to our site. Uh, one of my friends was asking me and some coworkers what our favorite aspect of the site was. And we kind of all looked at each other, you know, we you know, scraped our sides, and we didn't really have an answer. We didn't know what our favorite feature was, and it's because we weren't using the site. 
which we then admitted to. And you know, our friend prodded us along, well, why aren't you using it? We gave some humdrum, oh, I don't want to talk about work, it's complicated, you wouldn't understand, something, something, valley buzzword. Um, but then we finally, you know, they persisted and we got through it and we started laying down the you know, laying down the items. It was the site was slow. Uh, the user interface was not discoverable. It was difficult to navigate. And yeah, it just it was garbage. Um, and surprise, surprise, the company wasn't there uh, you know, six months later. Um, but it was this revelation because you get so easy to get heads down, focused, worrying about your delivery rules, worrying about, you know, worrying about, uh, worrying about your metrics, uh, that you lose sight of the fact that some people just aren't using your site anymore. Um, so a couple of really good, you know, a couple of examples of, of people in the wild uh, using using their own software. From again, from that idea of the salesman and you know, practicing what you preach and proving that what you do is so good. Um, Git's one of my favorite examples of this. Uh, the Git, the, we, so we use it within OpenEdX, um, source control management. And for those of you that like to geek out and read old Linux kernel mailing list posts, uh, this is a really interesting, yeah, no one, no one. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a student of history, I enjoy it. Um, but what's really fun about this is seeing that this was, there was an itch that needed scratch. There was something they needed to do. They needed to replace the software. And within just about a week's time, went from writing the first line of code for the Git project to actually using Git to track Git source code. Um, if anything would have gone wrong, I mean, hopefully Linus Torvalds had, had off-site backups, because we all do, right? Off-site, no. Um, and, but so the, and so the idea is, is he, if he was tr gonna trust the actual, the history of his code and the changes from version to version, uh, the canonical source of his project uh, to the project itself, that means he had to have had some faith in it. Um, another one that, that hits close to home for us is AWS, uh, particularly EC2. Uh, this was, uh, as Amazon, a decade or so ago, was industrializing their infrastructure. They knew that they had solved and were gonna continue solving some really complicated uh, you know, scaling problems when it comes to hosting. It realized if they were able to perform at such a high level and worry about all these ins and outs, that that would have been just like, that would be overkill even you know, for anyone else. And that so if they could do it, it would work for anyone else. Um, and yeah, here we are. What you know, more like I said, more than a decade later, this is a billion-dollar industry. Um, I don't know what I would do for my job if AWS just crapped out tomorrow. Um, so yay, avail availability zones. Um, but again, right, it's it's not always positive. There, because we're we're revealing that lens of truth, uh, you know, into our software, it can go the other way. We can get a, a you know a taste of that bad medicine that we've been dishing out. Um, the two really big examples of this. So, 15 years ago, AOL, Time Warner merge, and they made the decision that they were going to use AOL email across the board for the company. Yeah, that's that was my reaction. Ouch. Um, so, what did they see? They saw dropped emails. They saw, you know, they saw, uh, you know, uh, falling productivity, and they ended up canceling the initiative uh, because it went so poorly. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, there was a global exchange, uh, global market uh, stock exchange uh, system that was, uh, you know, coming out with their public offering. They figured, great, we built this software to manage to manage this. We're going to release with it. Um, you know, day of launch, system glitches come out, uh, the whole thing falls apart, and they end up having to completely rescind their public offering. Um, yeah, it wasn't good. Um, but again, and it's not, you know, it's not, the problem wasn't that they used their own software. It was the idea that by using their own software, they revealed these issues that they weren't otherwise seeing. Um, so what about us? How are we using this? How are we not using this? How, 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 can, how can we use our own software more? So at, uh, at Stanford, we, so we have a really great thing uh, that, where'd she go, Monica? Monica Diaz, uh, Greg Bruns, who's not here, and our course operations team maintain our, what we call, affectionately call our demo course. Uh, this is demo.class.stanford.edu. And the beautiful thing about this is it really kind of walks you through, walks you through everything that you can do with a course, shows you the different components. Um, and so for one, it allows you to really to, to poke through, actually walk through, interact, push, have something push back on you. Um, but it also then you know, provide, uh, provides help, gives you pointers throughout it. So it's not just showing you it, but it's also providing XML snippets for, you know, for example, the conditional module, which you, know, you can't, or, uh, yeah, conditional module, which you can't do through Studio, I think, unless I'm wrong on this one. Um, but so there's some things that you have to edit in XML only. Um, and so this then even gives you that code sample. So someone that's less technical, thanks for fact-checking me here, Marco. Um, yeah. Um, 
but uh, yeah, so it's so it's you know, like so this. I think this is a really valuable resource in that the others, the other side benefit that it gives us is it allows us to test for uh, for regressions in the software as well, uh, because we know that these are the main components, the main things that we you know some of the main things we always want to be working. Uh, we're able to tell if we bring in a, if we merge in a large update from edX.org, uh, we put it on our staging servers. We can see it, does the demo course still work? Um, so it gives us insights into you know into possible breakages like that. Um, the other thing that we leverage with a demo course is a feature that's specific to that's uh, specific to our fork at Stanford, which is well, there we have a lot of names for it: direct access, unauthenticated access, sneak peek. Uh, the idea is, is to be able to preview a course without actually signing up for it, to be able to explore, poke around. So not only can people get a feel for how the platform work, looks and feels uh, at Stanford, but they don't even need to sign up for an account for it, um, which is really nice. Um, and yeah, so this uh, yeah, just a, a quick example of you know what this looks like. Like I said, and it's basically just a drill down then of the different types. And it starts, uh, in my understanding of it too, you know, it starts starts off general, starts off talking about videos, text, HTML, and then as you progress through, it gets towards gets to, uh, into your more complicated topics. Uh, so that's a start. So that's one place we can use it, but. You know, we, you know, I'm not talking earlier, and everyone else. You know, if we're if we're really talking about, you know, about changing education, if our software is really that good, how is it that it's how is it that we can't be leveraging it more for the things, that, you know, for for the work that we do day to day? Um, so, you, if you want, you can close your eyes, uh, just put your imagination hat on. Um, but so imagine it's your first day getting involved with Open Edx again, uh, or getting involved with Open Edx. So you're you're working with a new development team. You're probably you know you're in, working in a new building somewhere. Uh, you have all these different ins and outs. You know, cu there's cultural orientation you're going through. Um, you know, it's a new team. Maybe you're working with a new stack. You haven't worked with Python or Nginx before. Um, I mean, like I said, it was two years ago for me. I remember it being intimidating. Starting a new position always is, and the more information we throw at people, the more you know, the more difficult that can be. Um, so, but you know, your worries are set aside when your manager grabs you, says, "Don't worry, we have this onboarding document. Here you go. Read through it. It's got everything you need." Yeah, that's how I remember mine actually. Um, but right, so you read through, it, and so the thing, and so, and so now there's this, you know, breathe a sigh of relief. Okay, this is what I was looking for. My questions have been answered. It actually isn't that complicated. Um, oh, yeah, but if you need anything else, it's, oh, it's all in the wiki. Um, who's had an orientation that then you get sent to a wiki that looks like this? This, honestly, this is probably like two thirds of my onboarding processes have been like this. Um, wikis are great when you know what to look for, when, you know, when you're able to lever leverage search. But let's remember, when you get thrown into a wiki, you don't even know the colloquialisms on the team yet. Uh, you know, for at our team, so we use the terms origin and upstream to just offhandedly refer to Stanford and, and, and edX, edX.org itself. Um, but if we're just sprinkling that in our internal communications, origin, upstream, and you're just thinking about the generalized terms uh, as, as, as they're used in Git, you may not then understand that, that, that relative, you know, that relationship that we have. Um, so yeah, the wiki doesn't help. So the, where do we go from here, right? It's, it'd be nice if, I don't know, if we had a way where we could, you know, talk about what we do, we could explain it to people, we could reinforce some fundamentals. Um, and yeah, I'm playing around. We have a solution. Um, this, this is what we do. Um, it's easy to lose the forest for the trees. But what about developing an Open Edx course uh, that talks about developing for the Open Edx platform? Um, you know, I, so I, you know, I toyed, you know, when playing around with this idea, um, I kind of kick myself for a while, right? It's I do all these things all the time. When I'm working, you know, when I'm running through some manual tests, I'm adding sections, I'm adding subsections, I'm moving content around, I'm doing all these things. But again, it's not towards that. It wasn't towards that explicit goal, um, and I kind of just lost sight of it. Um, so, yeah. So, so leveraging that then. So one of the things that that, that I've been working on for the team, um, you know, as we as we just have a new a new engineer at Casey starting with us uh, this past week here as well as an, an undergraduate intern who's gonna be starting with us next week. Um, and so they're gonna be able to leverage uh, the first of our onboarding, cor uh, the first of our onboarding courses. Um, so this, the, the course itself, it's, so this really builds off of, uh, off of the keynote this morning, talking about that on-ramp and building people through and what are those common friction points. So what, I, mean, I think it's important to emphasize you know, what this course is, but also what it's not. It's not a it's not a it's not a depot for all of your answers. It it's not a one stop shop to to tell you how to fix every kind of problem you're going to encounter. But what it is is it's it's a guide to tell you 
where to look for the answers, and but more specifically, how to ask the right kind of questions. Um, and a lot of these cultural things that, that often get overlooked because we take them for granted. Um, you know, I mentioned I've been with the team for two years. I'm still the new guy. Uh, I will. Thanks, Casey. Not anymore. Um, but right, and so it's, and so, but we get into our systems, and it's easy to forget the you know those little details that really go a long way for somebody new. Um, so my horror story when I started, uh, you know, a few years ago here, was there's an important mailing list that our team uses. It's the team mailing list where we do all of our back and forth daily communication. Turns out I didn't know it existed for about 30, 40 days. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, and so it, it was one of those, you know, at first I thought, you know, when people mentioned, oh, it's an email, it's an email, I figured, oh, just must be above my pay grade, I must not have to worry about it. Um, but then it got to the point where I had enough of those situations where I felt like I was missing something, and so finally I just asked. I said, I think I'm not on an email list. Oh, we forgot, let's add it to, the let's add it to our onboarding doc, et cetera, et cetera. But here I was, for, literally for my first month, I had no idea what anyone was talking about. Um, by and large, and so it really is, that's such a little thing, uh, goes such a long way though. Um, and yeah, so the course itself lets us do some other things. Um, you know, we're able to, not necessarily, even when we're not testing for proficiency, we can even leverage the platform for, for data collection as well. Um, by, you know, prompting the, the user for, you know, the normal information, oh, what email do you prefer us contacting you with? Uh, by asking them to input the data like that, um, we can then uh, have that data that was imported, er, er, sorry, added as a submission, then we can generate one of the student submission reports, and then now we have a listing of all of our, all of our internal users who went through the course, what were their answers for all these things? Has, okay, have they completed the work? Have they done the graded assignments? But have they, you know, have they essentially in, fill, uh, filled out the survey that we asked them to do? Um, maybe that's not the best long-term way to do it, but it, it is a way to, you know, to leverage the system just with the, the pieces that we have right there, right off the shelf. Um, and then even just even just the the little reminders and the little drillings on the again where to reach out for things. If I had a dollar for every time Ned had to mention to somebody to somebody new on the mailing list that hey this is the wrong place it's actually you'll have we'll have a much better conversation over here. And the thing is I get it right it makes sense right this is the way that we you know that we manage our conversations. But if we didn't have to do that, um, if it was what, a, if it was one less thing that you know that the staff had to do, but also that can be a jarring thing for somebody right away. It's it's not malicious on their part. Sure, they should should have searched. Yeah, they should have RTFM. Um, but these things happen, and we don't want to scare people away from it. Um, so if we can provide it to them in a way that they can really it can really drill home, um, all the better. Um, yeah, this is kind of just yeah, recapping on as I threw this slide in today, fortuitous with the keynote and everything. Um, but yeah, this isn't, like I said, there, while I think there's a lot of room for growth, there are more things we can do, uh, you know, as far as courses on more technical subjects. The idea of even just like that, that, that cultural orientation, um, that thing where you would normally spend eight hours talking to HR and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, depending on what kind of group you're with. Um, this is something, the idea is that you can then just sit down walk through this and it doesn't take as much time and you get to do it at your own leisure. Um, wow, I've heard those selling points for education before. Um, and yeah, so to kind of just walk you through my development process, how I went about this. So I opted, uh, and I might be wrong, maybe I'm missing details. I, for a couple of reasons, I opted not to use, even though I was using Git to track things, I didn't use the, the MIT Git-based workflow. Um, instead, I just, so I spun up a, de uh, a dev stack locally. Uh, from there, then, I would go in, I would make a, a very small isolated change. Um, I had a bookmarklet set up in Chrome. I'd click that. It would dump the file in the right place, a Git shell script that would then move everything in the right place. Um, and so I kind of went, this, this is it's a lot more back and forth than you really need. Um, the reason that I went through this process is viewing it as a learning experience myself. I really wanted to see how, when I make a subtle little change in the, in the studio user interface, what's the impact on the output on the, the rendered XML on that? Um, and again, even after two years working with this software, just taking those explicit steps of adding a section, 
seeing how it changes the XML, adding another thing, and then just and then even replaying through my my Git log through my history and being able to see how that that user front end facing change affects things on the back end. Um, I found that insightful, um, and I, this is one of those areas uh, in retrospect where I think I'll probably go back, revisit this, and actually use this then as a learning opportunity, uh, you know, for our new developers as well um, as they try to get, get a better grasp on uh, on the way that we had, handle uh, that course data. Um, yeah, I didn't, I, admittedly my use case was fairly straightforward, so I, there were, I wasn't using a lot of the more complicated things, uh, complicated parts of the site. I, you know, I wasn't using, um, I wasn't using cohorts, I wasn't using conditionals. Uh, there were a lot of other things that I, you know, that I could find a way to leverage that I wasn't. Um, so yeah, so, so at least as far as my, my interaction with how simple it was, I found the play, I, honestly, I, I was a little bit worried heading into it um, that it was going to be more difficult, that maybe I'd bitten off more than I could chew. It mostly worked. Um, I had some minor UI grievances here and there, um, but as far as me being able to go in, I'm a command line guy, and honestly, building this course out, I did, almost, I did it almost exclusively in studio. Uh, it worked well enough. Um, that said, I probably wouldn't do that for, you know, I, I'm not going to do that long term. Uh, yeah, I'm a VI guy, sorry. Um, but... Yeah. So, but um, but yeah, a pretty pleasant experience. The one thing that we use that you don't get in uh, off the shelf uh, the edX uh, edX platform is a an X block, an extension that one of our uh, research assistants, Azim Pradhan, worked on. Uh, we call it the free text X block. And so on the platform, you know, so we can you can ask us, you can prompt a student to input a short answer, and there's a right or wrong, you know, there are right or wrong answers. Um, but what the free text response Xbox does is it allows for arbitrary answers. So you can def you can say the answer has to have at least one word, but no more than ten words. Uh, you can require certain words be present for partial credit. Require other words be pre uh, keywords be present to get full credit. Um, and so this then worked, especially particularly for, like I said, those, those data collecting uh, questions that I had. What's your email address? There, there's no right, there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. We just need an answer, uh, and this this worked well for that. Um, so yeah, so so moving beyond this now, um, there are a lot of ways we can go with this. Um, it really is just starting out. The you know there are a couple of easy ones that pop up. I know I want to work on a, my my first pull request. Um, you know, I know edX, edX maintains internal docs on this, you know, cover letters, things like that. But really just walking someone through what that first process, what that first uh, pull request is going to look like. So they're not shocked when they get slammed then with 100 different questions and no, this is in the wrong place. Why would you go about it this way? Um, even the little things as far as, you know, this is Pepe, Pilot, and these are the quality checks that we're going to make. Um, just avoids that back and forth and sets people up for success the better the first time through. Um, you know, adva advanced work with the dev stack, troubleshooting dev stack, um, and some of these things are things that maybe don't need a, a large course, you know, a large dedicated course, but, but can be spun off into mini courses like Jennifer Whittem does uh, with her database courses uh, that she talked about earlier today. Um, you know, we could even, you could even imagine a world where, you know, tying in prerequisites, right, where you have to take the Open edX onboarding course before you can take the Stanford uh, Open edX onboarding course before you can take the dev stack, et cetera, et cetera, and that way we can really work people, you know, through through this series of uh, of knowledge acquisition. Um, another idea that I had, so I, I like repurposing technology to do other things uh, without having to build out special case logic. Um, and so we used to have, and I believe I believe it's been removed. There used to be a checklist feature uh, in the studio uh, has now been removed um, just because you know how how. It, how how it worked, or rather, didn't work, uh, in lieu of uh, you know the other forms of documentation. Read the docs would probably be my big assumption. Um, but again, the, with read the docs, you run into the same issue as you have uh, with with a big wiki. In that, if you don't know what you're looking for, um, if you don't know what keywords to search for, um, it ends up being uh, more difficult for you. Um, so one idea is the idea of imagine then if you you spin up your dev stack for the first time uh, or even in in production you create a new course and instead of just being an empty course uh, or instead of being the the demo course that comes with dev stack now if it was a course with components that actually guided you through the the creation of it reminds you to go check on things reminds you to to flip, to toggle certain values um, and then you can actually then then remove that helper uh, component from the course when you're done. Um, Again, maybe unwieldy, um, but it's you know it's an area that we could play around with. Um, so I, you know, I coming into this, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with the hackathon. I didn't have a big project I wanted to work on, 
But as I've kind of come down the line with this, I think this, this really is what I'm going to be focusing on is, well, you know, I'll naturally spend a little bit of time fine tuning Stanford's work on this. But I think the, the big deliverable for this would be something that works for the community. Uh, you know, like I said, this really picks up uh, from the keynote today of how do we guide someone through? How do we welcome them in? And how do we bridge that first, that first big gap there and get them to, to adopt the, the, the work? Um, so yeah, anybody that's interested in that, come get me. There's no Slack channel for it yet. Uh, I'll create one for it though. Um, yeah, so this, I think the, really the big takeaway uh, from this is, yeah, I don't like telling people to do, but yeah, sometimes I like telling people what to do. You should use your software, seriously. Um, whether it's OpenEdX, whether it's something else, um, even if you do backend DevOps work, go spin up another server from scratch. Uh, put your, the, you know, again, empathy, put yourself in that user's shoes, whether it's you know whether it's uh, an actual student walking through a course, um, or whether it's another you know if you work on the Open edX team uh, and you want to make yourself feel like an open source developer, I mean, bad wording. Uh, you are all open source developers, um, but yeah, really write code, go do or sorry, you've been writing code, now go use it, go see how it works, um, because I, honestly, the like I said, I'm. It surprised me that, that we haven't done enough work on this already. I'm really excited to see what kind of other, you know, what kind of other ideas people have, how we can make better courses to make it a stronger platform. I mean, imagine the, the, the entire ecosystem being self-documenting. Uh, as you walk through it, as you use the code, it tells you how it wants to be used. Uh, you know, imagine pulling down a dev stack for the first time. You grab your Vagrant file, you say Vagrant up, and you start the server and there's a course that says, okay, the next thing you need to do is, and then it walks you, actually walks you through your development. That's, that's about as close to one-stop shop onboarding, I think, as we can get. Um, so yeah, so, so keep thinking about that. Think about what you're missing out. Think about all the annoyances. Think about all the insights that, that your users are picking up on that you're just leaving flat on the table. Um, so yeah, don't just imagine it though. Build it, hack it, just go do the damn thing. Go Penguins. <laughs> Okay. One thing that's kind of a pain point is I can't just put those on the web and let people go in and see the course and start to download it. So right. that direct access thing that you talked about sounds really cool. Are you guys envisioning that? So as it were, it's you know it's funny that I bring it up. This actually is a long stay. It's, we've had this code for years now. Um, you know, there dot dot dot. There are reasons why it didn't make it in before. Um, I, you know, our understanding is I think in its current state, I don't think it's it's not ready to land as it is. Right? It's especially at this point, years down the line, it's there are bits and pieces everywhere. Um, it's at the top. We have our big list of tech debt that we've been trying to pay down. This is one of the big things that we want to land. Uh, so yeah, the you know we've been floating around some ideas on how I think we can get that to land. Anybody that's curious, I would love to hear what your use cases are, and let's, we would love to stop maintaining it ourselves, and we'd love other people to use it too, so please. Any? Yeah, I mentioned this to you earlier, a great course, a great course. Um, so Mark Zanetti at edX created a mm -hmm. course on accessibility training when he was at edX, but everyone at edX has to be trained on accessibility techniques, and he did exactly what you're talking about. He built a course, and once a year we all have to take that course, and it's been fantastic. And so I think you should contribute that into your proposed pool of courses. Yeah, I'm the whole community could have it. Yeah, I think that's yeah, that's that's that larger initiative, right? Is you know, and then just yeah, building this this collected you know body of work uh, that people can tie on. Um, yeah, I was that that sounds like something Mark would do. So that's that's great to hear. Um, just taking that on. Um, but yeah, and that's, I think that's the big thing too. It's, I'm, it's great that you guys are revisiting it too. That's one of the ideas I've been playing with, even, even for the simple onboarding stuff, right? If having people that are familiar with it, even if we all would go through it again once a year, that makes sure we don't, again, forget to put Steven on the dang mailing list again. Yeah. No worries.
Yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, and especially if we're talking about that that very first day thing, right? And of if your entire learning and onboarding gets blocked because for some reason your your dev stack doesn't provision, which is the thing that happens. Um, yeah, that would that would be that'd be a, a huge misstep. So no, we should definitely have it public. Good point. There's already a course that was first introduced into edX that you can take mm -hmm. on edge. So we could have a whole program of developer onboarding. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, yeah. It could just be sign up for the program, and then, like you said, the first one is how do I even get started? You know? And I think this really speaks to how you know how the platform has been maturing over the years. Right? I mean, this I I don't think I would have imagined. I mean, granted, I could imagine building a course in OpenEdX two years ago. I can't imagine that that idea of tracks, right? And that you know, and you're in series and everything, um, and just progressively walking people through. Uh, and the fact that we can now, oh, we're just plugging the pieces together again shows shows how it's maturing. Just I mean, when I echo that, I think we're we're talking about right new websites and new tools and things for the on ramp so it's all in, in the vein of what you're talking about. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to mention is kind of like more a glint in our kind of like eye than necessarily like something that we plan for. But uh, we have a discussion forum. We it's deficient in a <laughs> number of ways. But once we can get it to a point where we can make it you know thing for, for students, we could be doing a lot more community discussion or engagement the sort of things outside of a course concept and discussion at the edX.org level when a student can talk to other students and see other knowledge. Like we could potentially use that elsewhere. So just want to point out that like there are other also ways to dog food that we want to explore. Yeah, definitely. Anybody else? Cool. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>